You have to put in place a process that has the confidence of your colleagues. I tell people that I never saw politics in the Situation Room, and they say, come on. Iran. It would be a very serious mistake for the United States to withdraw from this deal. We haven't really, to date, put together the most serious pressure campaign we could on North Korea. I mean, people say, well, yeah, they can't be pressured. The truth is, we haven't tried yet. This is Intelligence Matters with Michael Morrell, a joint production of the Cypherbrief.com and CBS News. I'm Cypherbrief CEO and publisher Suzanne Kelly. In this podcast, the former acting director of the CIA speaks with top leaders who talk candidly about what they've seen and what they think it means for global security. As a former CIA analyst, Morrell is uniquely skilled at asking the right questions and making connections that provide deeper insight into complex security events. Because intelligence matters. The United States faces a large number of very complex national security problems. There is nobody better to help us think about how the United States should deal with those than Tom Donilon, who was President Obama's national security advisor for almost four years. Tom brought care, discipline, and organization to one of the most difficult jobs in Washington. We'll hear what Tom learned during a long career and how he applied those lessons to advising the President of the United States. I'm Michael Morrell, and this is Intelligence Matters. So the United States faces today a myriad of national security threats and challenges from North Korea and Iran to China and Russia. And I can't think of anyone better to help us think about what the United States needs to do to address those than Tom Donilon, who served nearly four years as President Obama's national security advisor and someone who was widely rumored to be the leading candidate to be Secretary of State in the Hillary Clinton administration. Tom, welcome to Thank Intelligence you, Matters. It's a real honor to have you. Great. Nice to be here. Nice to see you. Tom, before we get to the issues themselves, I want to just ask a few questions about how you got from Providence, Rhode Island, to that rather big corner office in the West Wing of the White House. You grew up late 1960s in Providence. You were the son of Irish Catholic parents. Your maternal grandparents were immigrants to the United States. What was it like growing up in the Donilon household? What was it like growing up in, in Providence? Well, it was terrific. It was a very, very Catholic growing up kind of environment that I grew up in. You really wouldn't, in that neighborhood in Providence, Rhode Island, really wouldn't encounter someone who wasn't attending a Catholic mm -hmm. school very often. And it really kind of enveloped your life. So you were born in the Catholic hospital. You went to school at the Catholic elementary school and Catholic high school. Your sports teams were Catholic CYO, CYO teams. CYO, CYO, CYO teams. I know right? them well. You know, yep. You know, you were active in the parish council. So that really was the environment. It was more like a 50s environment, frankly, yeah. growing up in Providence during that time. Very interested in politics both kind of at the parish level, but at the city and state level as well. And where did that come from? I think it came from, you know, my parents are very interested in politics. It comes from, you know, kind of an Irish Catholic uh, high level participation in politics in the cities in the, uh, in the 1940s and 50s. And we were certainly part of that. My father ended up being the chairman of the local school board. Uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. My mother was a union organizer and the proud president of the uh, AFSME local for the school secretaries and janitors at the Providence school system so for many plenty, years. plenty of political conversation yeah, yeah. around the dinner table. Yeah, absolutely. And my yeah. siblings were very interested in politics too, and they all ended up, uh, many of them, well, three out of the four of us ended up involved in politics. So what values did that experience instill in you, do you think? Well, the premier value that was present in those neighborhoods was the value of education and the determination of uh, these families. And some of these families were very large, 10, 11, 15 kids, right, in some of these families. The determination of those parents to see that their children were going to get a better, better education than they did and that that was seen as the way forward. You know, the second value obviously was on, was, uh, was on families. A third, it was very democratic in terms of partisan politics. As, a, as an approach, and it was uh, progressive in, in many respects. As I said, my mother was you know, deeply involved in labor union politics for many, many years. Did you always lean progressive, or was there a time when, when Tom Donilon questioned his politics? I leaned progressive pretty hard all the way through my growing up. And then, of course, my first job out of college was in the White House right, in right. The, uh, June of 1977, working with President Carter. So when you were growing up, Tom, Vietnam was in full swing and the protests were, were starting, were underway. Yeah. Did that 
did that shape your worldview at all? I was a little behind, a little younger, a little young for that. That was probably four or five years ahead of my, you know, ahead of me, frankly. Was it, was it something that was talked about? It was certainly talked about. Yeah, certainly talked about it in my household. But again, I wasn't in the draft, for example. I had, I had to register for the draft. But the, the high point of both U.S. involvement in Vietnam and the domestic response to that involvement was a few years before me. You came to college in Washington. I did. Was that a reflection of the interest in politics and the interest in public service and affairs? And It was. It was a couple of things. First of all, I came to Catholic University in Washington, D.C. I was very interested in politics and studied politics at Catholic University. And of course, ended up really making some terrific friendships there, including with a number of professors at Catholic University involved in politics, Norman Ornstein, Michael Robinson, who were really terrific political scientists who really were the reason that I got involved working in the, in the White House. Interesting, during my time at Catholic University, I took, a, I took a long semester internship where I didn't take any classes and worked at the State Department historian's office. So that was the first, that was the first time you stepped into the State the Department first time to I work? Te- I did. I, I, I stepped into the State Department to work in... Uh, in 1976, yeah. uh, and worked on the, in the historian's office, and actually worked on a volume about the 1950s policy in the United Nations. And then, of course, when I many years later, I became chief of staff of the State Department, and one of the divisions they oversaw was the historian's office. So that is a very important part of the State Department. And I don't think most people know about it. I mean, you take a couple seconds and explain what it is they do. It's just a terrific, terrific institution at the State Department. And the principal product that they produce is something called the Farm Relations of the United States series, which is a documentary history of United States foreign policy from the beginnings of the country. And as documents become available and they become declassified, these first-class historians put together these really invaluable documentary histories, which are really just uh, tremendously important for historians who are writing histories of the diplomatic histories uh, of the period. It's a a wonderful office. Yeah. They do terrific work. I was deeply involved with that office when I was uh, when I was Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs, including working through some mechanisms which still exist today in terms of deciding declassification mm-hmm. issues. Are these folks full-time State Department employees, or are they academics who, who do this on the side? No, they're academics who come to work full-time for the State Department. Okay, for a period of time. Yeah, right, and or some for their career. Okay. And there's a, you know, the position, which is called the historian of the State Department, which is the chief historian. Right. I met with them two days ago working on some, uh, an outline for the Clinton volumes. Wow. wow. So you graduate from college, you mentioned this, and you find yourself in President Carter's White House. Right. How did that happen? I had a professor at Catholic University who knew that there was an opening for a young person at the White House to work in the Office of Congressional Relations. Michael Robinson was the professor's name, and he worked, as I said, worked very closely with Norm Ornstein, who remains a very good friend of mine today. And they had an opening there, and I started in the Congressional Relations Office, basically answering congressional mail the week after I graduated from wow. college. Wow. That doesn't happen to most college graduates. Yeah. And so I was, you know, one of President Carter's youngest assistants, and indeed, and worked very, very closely with him over the next three and a half or four years. What did you learn during those four years? Well, I learned a tremendous amount. You know, I worked in the, in the White House beginning in 1977, but I was one of the first people to go to the re-election campaign in March of 1979. My route to the to national security and foreign policy, you know, was an unusual route. I began my public service in, in a political office, in the Congressional Relations Office, and working for the chief of staff in the, uh, in the White House. So in March of 1979, I left to go work on the president's re-election campaign and ended up managing the convention at Madison Square Garden in 1980. How old were you then? I was 24 or 25 years old. And that, of course, was one of the great conventions, right, in right. recent history. It was a convention battle, you right. know, at a time when they were Ted really— Kennedy and- and Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter. When the nomination was at stake, right? Yeah. And it was a pitched battle for the nomination. I managed that convention at Madison Square Garden. a remarkable Garden. speech by Ted Kennedy. Remarkable speech by Ted Kennedy. And that really was kind of a, a real change in it in the country's outlook and ideology. There was a really deep set of conflicts on policy and between the moderate and liberal wings of the Democratic Party. And of course, what was happening was you had the rise of Ronald Reagan and the, and the new right during the late 1970s and resulted in the Reagan administration in 1981. So I was throwing it on the street in 1981 right, after right, my first right. job a by, lot of other people by then and... Governor, then Pre- President, uh, President Reagan. And then you decided to go to law school. I went to law school, but I did something in between. I went to Georgia with President Carter to work on his transition to, uh, to private life. And so I spent the first eight months of 1981 in, in Georgia 
working on opening up his office there and doing that transition. So this young aide at the White House really developed, sounds like developed a relationship with the president. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm just full of admiration for him to this day. There were, you know, there were you know, obviously uh, quite a bit of issues. It was kind of a perfect storm of, of trends and dynamics during the th- course of the Carter administration, including a, a difficult economic environment, taking of the Iranian hostages, the uh, challenge uh, to President Carter inside his party and the person of Senator, of Senator Kennedy. So it was kind of a perfect storm for him. He was a very young president and he was defeated. But I did become close to him and worked very close with him and very proud of that association. Indeed, I'm, I'm actually working on a lecture that I'm going to give at the University of Minnesota uh, later this fall on a kind of a taking another look at President Carter's foreign policy. And we all know a lot of the issues, the Iranian hostage crisis, the failure in 1980, November of April of 1980 for the rescue mission right. and all manner of things. But there's actually a lot more continuity. Right. If you look at some of the durability of some of the initiatives, the Israeli Egyptian Accords, which obviously are still an important pillar of security right. in the Middle East, right. the Carter Doctrine in the Persian Gulf, right. you know, the formation of the Special Forces, which of course were very important right. to our, our careers, you know, there was actually much more continuity between his approach to the Soviet Union and, and President Reagan in terms of increased defense budgets and, te- and uh, technology, stealth and other technologies, and also challenging the legitimacy of the Soviet Union with respect to its human rights record. Right. It's interesting. And it was really overshadowed. All of that was overshadowed by Iran at the end of the day. It was overshadowed. In an unfortunate way. Overshadowed by that and a number of other things, but you know that's all well documented. You can look at some of the, the difficulties. I think it's also important to, to look at what's durable and what has persisted through bipartisan effort and you know, multiple administrations. It's important to reflect on those things, I think, once in a while. Why law school then? I went to law school at the University of Virginia Law School, and I was interested in law, was interested in politics, and always thought that that's what I would do. I would have gone to law school if I hadn't gone to work in the White House in 1977. So one of the things that always struck me was how many lawyers there were sitting around the sit-room table, whether in lawyer jobs or whether in policy jobs. Why do you think that is, and would you recommend to a young man or a young woman interested in foreign policy, national security, to go to law school? I would recommend it. I think, you know, in my own case, I think I derived or developed a number of skills which were absolutely critical. Discipline, care in reviewing arguments. Writing, which is a very important a skill to have in the policy in the policy world, as you well know, was one of the best writers. I thought it was a tremendously valuable, tremendously valuable set of skills that I was able to you know kind of develop in law school. But it wasn't what I was going to do when I got out of law school. When I got out of law school, I was going to open up a consulting firm. Oh, really? Yeah. And this is the importance of mentors. And I had an, uh, there was an intervention in the person of Warren Christopher, who was the lead partner and the chairman of the firm with which I became associated for almost 30 years. And he uh, asked to see me during my last semester of, of law school. And I How did he up, know you? I knew him. He was deputy secretary of state okay. uh, during the Carter administration. And he was kind of a, a collector of people. He was a mentor to many, many people. He was a kind of a mid-century American type, modest but with kind of a, you know, kind of steel will uh, and determination, a real problem solver and a a tremendous gentleman, uh, a letter writer, constantly stayed in touch with people that he met. And he really consciously mentored young people. And I was incredibly fortunate to be one of the people that fell into his orbit. So he called you up and said, I want you to come to my firm. I'd like you to come have lunch. And he said, what are you going to do? And I described him what I was going to do. And he said, well, there's a different way to go about your your career. What kind of consulting were you thinking about? I would have done political consulting. I remember I was was still in my 20s. And he he said, well, there's a different way to go. He said, you might want to actually learn something and learn a skill. And you can do that at, uh, at our law firm and use that as a base from which you can be become involved in public service. And that was his life. Uh, he had been involved in public service as a member of, of this law firm, O'Melvin e. Myers, from the time he worked for Governor Pat Brown in the 1950s, and then for Jack Kennedy. And then he was Deputy uh, Attorney General. And then he was Deputy Secretary of State, and ultimately, obviously, Secretary of State. And he, he passed, he pushed across an envelope across the table at lunch that day, and he said, read this book and give me a call and let me know what you think. So I took the book back to Charlottesville. It took me a while to read it. It was a long book. And it was Dean Acheson's President of the Creation, which is about a lawyer at a law firm in Washington, you know, who uses it kind of as his launching pad to come, into, come in and out of government. And I read the book and I called him, called Secretary Christopher, and I said, I'm in. And that's how I began my legal career. And that's how I began my interest, deep interest in foreign policy and worked on, you know, pretty aggressively working on, yeah. on that issue for the next 30 years. And before we leave the legal question, there is this issue of U.S. foreign policy and acting in a, in a way that's consistent with international law. And you understand how important that is. And I'd love it if you took a minute and explained to our listeners why that's so important. Yeah. Well, it's a, well, it's absolutely critically important. You know, the law, let's talk about domestic law first. You know, the law really reflects the values of our society. 
that's the way it's manifested is through our law, laws and then judges in turn interpreting those laws. And I, uh, as you know, at the National Security Council, I insisted that we have a lawyer in, in every important meeting that we had, including in the smallest meetings that we had. And those were probably over the course of the eight months between August of 2010 and May of 2011 when we worked together very closely on the bin Laden uh, mm-hmm. project. And it It's important to have those values present in the room. Additionally, in the phase circumstances of our current foreign policy challenges, there are issues of first impression which are raised all the time which need the best thinking, frankly. What do you mean first impression? First impression, you know, you look, we had a number of these issues during the course of our tenure together, particularly, for example, in the counterterrorism area, where we would have any and all, all manner of issues. Right, I see. That really needed kind of careful thought by you know, fine lawyers who were going to keep us consistent with the country's values, who were going to look around corners and ask, if we do X, Y, and Z, what are the results of that? What are going to be the consequences two and three, four steps down the road? Are we going to be comfortable if what we're doing today becomes public? You know, and how are we going to, how will we present it? And how are we going to be sure that it's presented in a truthful way that's consistent with American values and law? I think all those things are really, obviously, really critical. And that's the value of having really fine international and other lawyers present in the policy process. And again, that was, you know, it's interesting. That position at the National Security Council arises out of the Scowcroft Committee, the Tower Commission, which looked at the circumstances in the Reagan White House post Iran Contra. Iran Contra. Yeah, right. And that recommendation was that, in fact, you have associated with the National Security Council a senior lawyer. Yeah, I remember uh, several times when we would have a discussion in the sit room and we'd come to an answer. And then, and then one of the lawyers would say, well, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. you, know, you can't break the law right, here, yeah. which is kind of important. Yeah. So you, you're in your legal career, yeah. um, but you come back to government at the first opportunity when Bill Clinton is elected in 1992. Right. And you served for four years at the State Department, both as the chief of staff to Secretary Christopher and then as the assistant secretary right. for public affairs. You said, and I, I agree with this wholeheartedly, that Warren Christopher is a remarkable man. What, what did you learn from him? Well, a tremendous discipline, integrity, a, you know, a real sense of the importance of your word, the importance of negotiation and diplomacy, how to go about a negotiation. And he, again, he was, a, he was a unique, he was a mid-century type of American who had really just tremendously modest a uh, person. A little, you know, it's, it's a, uh, we're in a different world right now where people put themselves out there much more publicly. People take credit for things much right. more aggressively. You they, know, have it's, it's a, it's, yeah, <laughs> they have podcasts. Yeah, they have podcasts, right? You know, it's a different world, right? You know, but he was of a different, a different world. So I, I learned a tremendous amount from him. And, you know, and he was able, it's interesting, he was able to get the, to gain the confidence over the years of CEOs as a lawyer judges as an advocate, a presidents as an advisor, and other heads of state and foreign ministers as an interlocutor. And I think that uh, it, was a, it was a real privilege to, to work with him. He was also a tremendously good writer and a, you know, just a, a fine man. I came to that job at the State Department, though not Christopher and I kind of worked in parallel. He, was, he did the vice presidential search for That's then right. Governor Clinton, which resulted in the selection of uh, Al Gore. That selection, by the way, turned out to be maybe the most important thing that happened in the campaign. It really was the point at which Clinton was able to consolidate his support and move, move ahead during the summer of 1992. I had a parallel job. He was working on the vice president's selection process. I was charged with overseeing uh, Governor Clinton's debate preparation during the 1992 campaign. What and is that like? Preparing somebody for well, one it's of those also debates. I headed up the debate preparation for uh, Senator Obama in, in 2008 as well. You know, it's become a very important part of the presentation of a candidate to the country. They're the you know they're the most watched events during the course mm-hmm. of the uh, of the general election campaign. I think they're exceedingly valuable compared to what the other stuff that happens during the course right. of a campaign because it forces candidates to stop and think about their policies and how they're going to present them. You know, and you you know during debate preparation, so you're saying that the, that the prep is almost as valuable. important as yes, the, yeah. I think it's valuable because they have to stop and then. And kind of in the seams and the weaknesses of, of your arguments and your policy positions are tested. And you're tested in terms of your ability to communicate in efficient ways to the American people where you're coming from. So I think that there's a lot of flaws. Right? And there have been innumerable commissions and right. task forces on the weaknesses and the downsides of presidential debates. But compared to the rest of campaigning, I think they're really important. And uh, it does force uh, candidates to really kind of come to grips with how they're going to explain themselves to the American people. Is the focus in debate prep on finding gotcha moments and avoiding gotcha moments by the, the opponent? Or is it broader than that? How do I get my strategic message across? Oh, it's or is it all of that? that? It's all of that. But at the core, though, you, there's obviously communications and political aspects to this. But at the core, you have to have a serious confidence in your substantive positions. You have to be able to operate from that platform of some confidence and then 
move on to the other the other elements in the communication side. So that's how I came to the. Of course, Christopher and I were on parallel tracks. Then we joined up in the transition. He became director of the transition in, in 1992 when I was counsel to him during the transition, and then went to the state. Department. And he asked you to come be his yeah, chief of staff. Yeah, to come to the state department be chief of staff. Yeah. So were there issues? such as the Balkans, other issues that you and the secretary worked through during those four years that shaped your worldview? Yeah. You know, we a number of issues. And there were, you know, this is the period, uh, obviously, you know, right after the fall of the Soviet Union. And we were able to build on a lot of the things that the Bush 41 administration had done, Secretary Baker's team had, uh, had put together. So if you look at the range of issues that I became pretty deeply involved in, it, and it did, it did shape a lot of my outlooks, uh, Europe starting with Europe, we engaged in a serious and successful effort to expand NATO. That was a decision after the fall of the Soviet Union to maintain the organization, which had been, of course, built to resist and defend against uh, the Soviet Union, but to maintain and retain that organization and to expand it because it had the ability to expand democracy and freedom, right, and to orient uh, countries towards civilian control of the military right. and orient it to the West, and I think bring a lot of stability. We saw that and entered into a entered into a, a serious effort to expand NATO uh, during the 1990s. There's been some criticism of that. There was right. criticism right. then, right? right? There was right. resistance right. then. People right. from George we Cannon went, on. And we went too far. We went, we too, went, far went too far and, east. And, yeah. Too confrontational. I asked this question, though, that given uh, Vladimir Putin and his return to the presidency of the Russian Federation in 2012 and the hostile posture that he has struck across the board, where would we be without NATO expansion? That really has been, I think, an important bulwark against and a hedge, really, against kind of renewed Russian hostility and efforts to undermine the West. So that was a really important kind of a shaping experience uh, for me. It was deeply involved in the Dayton, the Dayton Peace Accords and worked very closely with Dick Holbrook, who was the lead was one of the great one of the great diplomats and real I got to know him when I was deputy director and he was the AFPAC coordinator and he would call me up and yell at me and and then 5 minutes later we would we would be friends again he was a big figure and he was a, a deep believer in the great you would say great man, great person theory of history. It was not about trends and numbers yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it, was, yeah, it was about it was about people making history. Yeah. And he had the, and he the, was going to be one of those people. And he was going to be one of those people. Right. And he was one of those people. He, he This was a guy who, if you were in the room, he was able to convince the parties in the room. And he was born to do these big negotiations. I remember having the conversation with him before going out to Dayton, right, where he was convening uh, the parties to the Balkan Wars and him saying, you know, I have been preparing my whole life to do this. And he was, and he did. He was, he could convince, he was had the ability to convince the people who were in a room with him, that the thing they were working on was the most important thing in the world. And it could be bringing, which he did, bring peace to the Balkans after a terrible war, or it could be what restaurant you're going to go to that night. It was, he had yeah. that, he was one of those big yeah, personalities. Yeah. And he had, boy, just a tremendous sense of history. And what I took from him, it's an interesting point, and I, I gave the commencement address at CIFA at Columbia uh, University a couple of years ago, and I ended with this, and it was, how do you prepare to be a policymaker? And Dick was obsessed with history and was constantly putting books on my desk and pressing historical analogies and examples. And he's right. You know, one of the single most important things a policymaker can do, and we don't do enough of it, and enough. our policymakers are really, in many cases, really deficient in this, is to read history and read it again and read right. it obsessively. As and you Dick know, did. As you know, Graham Allison at Harvard believes deeply in what you just said and actually believes that there should be a, a formal part of the national security process where you go over the history of the issue before you dive into the options for dealing with it, right? And it actually makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I think so too. It was a, it's a really, and so lots of work on and really kind of shaping uh, my views on Europe and NATO, the nature of Europe, the, imp the nature of alliances, both in Europe and in Asia. We did a lot of work, obviously, on Russia during that period. And last uh, on that list I would be Asia, which became a deep interest of mine, as you know. Mm -hmm. So the assistant secretary's job is very important. I'm not sure most Americans understand its importance, but one of the secretary of state's jobs is to speak to the world on behalf of America. How do we see the world? What do we want it to look like? What are we willing to do and not do to achieve that? I wonder your your sense of that job and that role and how important it is. Yeah, it was very important. We were very lucky. We had our spokesperson was Mike McCurry, uh, who ended up being one of the great presidential press secretaries for President Clinton. There are two places in the government, and it's not as disciplined today as it was, but traditionally, Let's talk about traditional precedent. There are two places in the government where there's a briefing every day that's on camera and we have a transcript. It's at the White House briefing room and at the State Department. 
And it is, you know, it's one of the key ways in which the United States communicates right. its views on the world. And it's done through a very disciplined process, should be done through a very disciplined process because it is a transcribed briefing every single day. And it's, it's very important. Uh, and that job is a very, very important job. I think, frankly, Michael, that I don't think that we're doing enough of this today. I don't think that we are spending enough time in a kind of a careful way right. explaining you know, U.S. foreign policy. I would like to see, you know, I would like to see the State Department do more. I'd like to see the Secretary do more. They're not doing it every day. Yeah, and it's a mistake. But even beyond that, you know, I also oversaw the speech writing process, for example. It's important for the United States government and its senior leaders to do front to back complete statements about policy approaches. Why is that? The world needs to hear it and clarity counts. I know we have, you know, some people think that unpredictability is important. I think clarity really counts. It also sends important signals to the government on where the president and the secretary are leading the government. I'm a big believer And the American people too, right? To have an understanding exactly of where, right, it's, yeah. where its government yeah. is going on these things. Yeah. So you have simultaneous audiences all over the world, enemies, allies, your colleagues. So it's an, I think it's a really important. I task. heard George Schultz say once that actually... Making foreign policy is actually pretty easy if you do three things. If you say what you mean, if you do what you say, and carry a big stick. And we're talking here about the say what you mean piece. And we do seem to be struggling with that a little bit at the moment. Yeah, yes. I think that's exactly right. And it requires discipline. It requires a process. And when you get to the end of that process, you need to have a policy, again, that you can explain the beginning, the middle, and the end of, right? And as a foundation document in speeches and presentations every day, it's really important. And I think, frankly, again, it's a, just a piece of advice, right? Uh, right? I would do a lot more that I think we would be in better shape. So during the Bush years, back to private practice, yep. and then really an experience of a lifetime when Barack Obama brings you into the White House, first to be the Deputy National Security Advisor and, and then the National Security Advisor. Do you remember the first time you met Barack Obama? I met then, then Senator-elect Obama during the period after his election and before he was sworn in in Washington, D.C. He asked for a few folks to get together in the, in the foreign policy realm, and we got together then, and that was the beginning of our association. What did you think of association. him? He's a very impressive person, as you know. Scary impressive. He has it, serious and unique leadership skills. And we saw that, obviously, during the course of his career. And a significant intellect. Yeah, yeah. A, a first-class intellect. I also think he has, a turn of phrase, he has a first-class temperament as well and world-class leadership skills. I think that's all quite fair. I, I know I'm, I'm biased, but I think those are very characteristics. You know, everybody has strengths and weaknesses, but I think that those are his, his strengths. So I met him very early on. And then uh, during the spring of 2008, was asked by David Axelrod and, and uh, to come out to Chicago, my colleague Ron Klain, to sit down and to, with and Senator Obama and to begin work in the spring on the debate preparation, and then was asked to come into the, and then did the State Department transition, and then went into the White House as Deputy National Security Advisor in the, on January 20th, 2009. Tom, did you, see, did you see an evolution in the president's view of the world during the time that you knew him? Of course, yeah. Well, you know, all presidents have an evolution. And all presidents obviously build up a cache of information and experiences. And yeah, I, th I think he would say that he would, and everyone who's being honest about this would say that they're a better president, you know, every year that they're in the, that they're in the presidency. They become more at ease making the kinds of decisions that you have to make as president. You build up a deeper information base. You build up relationships around the world. Uh, sure, I saw, you saw evolution, right? He came in, of course, in 2009, and the initial priority was on the economic side. Now, of course, that's also the most important national security priority. Right. You know, the country was in... And we were heading toward a depression. Seriously. Yeah. The country was in very bad shape uh, economically in the fall and of 2008 and the winter of 2009. Really. He doesn't get enough credit for... Uh for that. Yeah. And again, it's not a... He avoided the disaster. You know, it's interesting the, on both sides of it, right? You know, the, the United States really did suffer real damage internationally as a result of the financial crisis. And that's not recognized as much, I think, in the analysis as it should be where the United States has been. It was really important for the United States to demonstrate resiliency and the ability to snap back from that challenge. And that, as I said, that may have been, from the perspective of national security, the most important thing that he did was to revolve, which was to work on a plan successful plan, building on a number of things that the Bush administration had done at the end of their, at the end of their term, to build a successful plan to revive the American economy. And of course, we now have had you know, one of the longest stretches of economic growth in the history of the country. But what is... What you is, agree with that, don't you? That, that, the, that, that the economics, that this, this linkage absolutely. between ec economic strength and, absolutely. and the ability to, be, to maintain diplomatic and military primacy is absolutely critical. So I think, Tom, I think the most important determinant of a country's national security at the end of the day is the health of its economy and its society. It's, uh, it, it, history is absolutely clear on that point. What is, what is 
Tom Donilon's worldview. What what is your view of America's proper role in the world? The, the, the United States is the is the indispensable leader of of an international order put in place since World War II, which has resulted in tremendous prosperity and security for this country. And that involves um, building out a healthy economy, obviously. It is involved building out a strong alliance structure, which is the way that we interact with the world and it can operate around, around the world. Our alliances need to be appreciated as a unique American asset. None, no other potential competitor has anything like the American alliance system. And we, it, we benefit deeply from them. Exactly. It's not like we're helping them. We're benefiting deeply from it. We, you know, so some of the discussion of late about this, about what it costs the United States in order to have an alliance system, really doesn't take into account the deep benefits that the United States has gained from that system, right, and the work that we've done together as allies over the last over the last 70 years, that the United States has to lead in terms of um, maintaining international institutions, again, which are not perfect, but the United States has been the principal beneficiary of these institutions around the world. I have a, a, a strong belief, as you know, that the United States engagement in Europe, but we'll talk about Asia, has been absolutely critical. If you look at Asia over the last 70 years, the platform on which Asian development and prosperity has been built, has been the United States platform. And the United States presence and the security presence that the United States has had there. Uh, and absent that, if you do a thought experiment, uh, Asia would be a very different place than it is than it is today. So that's kind of the core you know, of my uh, approach, which is you know, the indif- indispensable nature of United States, uh, United States leadership. Now, the world's changing. And we've had you know, a number of trends right now which are challenging to the United States, including the reemergence of great power competition in a very serious way, principally from, but not, enti- not exclusively, from the Russian Federation, which is which has, you know, after a quarter of a century of the United States undertaking an integration project with the Russian Federation, both in economics and security and politics, has gone in a very different, very different direction. Right. Before we, we last piece on that, by the sure. way, the other piece of this is that the United States is just not a normal power. The United States also has been a provider of public goods around the world and a, and a exponent of values which have resulted in uh, tremendous prosperity and security around the world. And we really do ourselves uh, a real disservice to the extent we back off from the promotion of those values. And there is a competition, Michael, in the world today, not just among, as I said, among great powers, but there's an ideological competition in the world today. And the question is being presented to the world today, what about authoritarianism versus liberal democracy? Right? What's better? What's the better system? It's and back, isn't it's it? It's back, right? It's back. And they're, you know, so, you know, I mean, Francis Fukuyama famously declared at the end of history in 1989 and whenever he wrote his famous article in the book, history is back in a very big way. And there is a real debate in the world that's pushed by some of the major powers in the world asking the question, what's the better system? So we are in a real fight on this, in my judgment. Tom, before we actually turn to some specific national security issues, last question I wanted to ask you, what are the keys to someone being successful as a national security advisor? Let's say, um, Remarkably important job, difficult one. I know that you have a you have a view on what the role of the national security advisor should be, and, and I'd love to have you share that. Well, it's uh, the national security advisor's job is, to, is obviously to ensure that the president is given everything that he needs or she needs to make uh, to make the best decisions possible. But but you know, but more specifically, you run an interagency process, and you have to put in place a process that has the confidence of your colleagues. And, you know, in my case, our colleagues were very prominent people and Americans, right? You know, as I look down the table chairing a, right. a, a principals committee meeting, you'd have Vice President Biden, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Gates, you know, Secretary Panetta, Dave Petraeus, Dick yeah. Holbrook, and we can yes. go on down the yes, line, yes, right? Yes, you know? yes, yes. Uh, and all of whom have deep experience in the government, right? All of whom have strong views. And to the extent that they don't have confidence in the process, you're going to have a real problem in terms of getting timely and good decisions made. So it's really important that you develop a process that that has the confidence of the, uh, of the participants. And you also need from the outset to get the agreement of those participants that they're going to participate in this process as the exclusive process for making policy. Dwight Eisenhower said something, once said something along the lines of, a, a good process won't guarantee you a good outcome, but a bad process will almost always guarantee you a bad outcome. And if you go back through history, in recent history, and you look at some of the most serious mistakes made in American foreign policy, you will find a process problem present in a number of those, in a number of those cases. So getting people to buy into that process, participate in it, and it has to be effective and fair and transparent and uh, something in which your, your colleagues are going to have confidence. That's the most important job of the National Security Advisor on behalf of the president. Now, you also have the, the obligation of giving the president your best advice and you know, ensuring that he has 
everything that he needs to do the best job he possibly can. So it's a multiple, and you also engage, you're deeply involved in the, in the daily briefing of the president every day, involved in his trips and his public statements. So it's, it's a terrific position. Uh, there's a, as you know, there's a historically really important line of uh, important national security advisors that I've derived a lot of wisdom from over the years. It's also, by the way, last thing I say about this, really a nonpartisan group. Now, I had my roots in in American politics, but as you move into this area, right, it's interesting. If you look at where America is today, and again, I've been involved pretty deeply in American politics for 40 years. It wasn't always this way, but there's almost no talking across the aisle in the political sphere. There's almost no relationships across in the domestic sphere, really. There is in the foreign policy sphere, and we're lucky to keep it that, you know, that some of my, you know, good close friends and really important advisors when I was national security advisor were uh, people from the other party who were Republican national security advisors and other officials who were always available to help. And there is that, there still is that sense of nonpartisanship, protecting the country, right, you know, at all costs, and this great, and this tremendous devotion to that above and aside from partisan politics. It's one of the places in the country where we're still, where we've still got this, I think, and we need to preserve it. Yeah, I tell people that I never saw politics in the Situation Room, and they say, come on. And I said, no, I never saw it. I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm talking about you know, the um, really the the commitment to the country's security from, uh, from people from both parties, right? You know, I would have uh, my some of my predecessors in uh, once a quarter to sit down and uh, go over things and get critiqued, and right. uh, and it was immensely valuable. And I remember the the chairman of one of my committees, Mike Rogers, yeah. at the House Intelligence Committee, would want to come see you, and you would take the time to see him. Absolutely. So let's, let's run through some of the issues of the day, four of them. I'll start with North Korea. Kim Jong-un on the brink of demonstrating a capability of putting a U.S. city at risk of nuclear attack. The president saying that is not going to happen, along with a war of words between the two that, uh, that, in my view, is not helpful. But your sense on what direction we need to go here? Yeah, it's, a, it's obviously a first-class security problem uh, right now. What's happened, of course, is that the, in a number of dimensions, the North Korean program has moved more quickly than outside analysts expected. And, uh, and as I said, across a number of dimensions, if you read, the, read the, what's in the press, right, numbers, the right. ability to, uh, to launch over a long distance an ICBM and certain technological aspects as well. I think we need to have a serious, we went through a project in the Iran case where we, there's some lessons to be learned. One is we put together a comprehensive and very serious pressure campaign. Now, Korea is different than Iran, right? They're very different countries, and Iran wanted to be involved in the, in, the, in the global economy. But we haven't really, to date, put together the most serious pressure campaign we could on North Korea. I mean, if people say, well, yeah, they can't be pressured. The truth is we haven't tried yet to put together the kind of comprehensive pressure that we did with respect and to Iran. Multilateral, and, and fully, multilateral. And multilateral. Fully right? multilateral. And we did last week, I think, and it's positive that the president signed an executive order giving the Treasury Department for the first time the ability really to lean in to people and entities who are going to do business or, or try to do business with, with Korea and uh, do something about it, including the Chinese. Uh, and I think, that's, I, think that's, I think that's important. So I do think there needs to be a much more pressure uh, put on the put on the North Koreans with an eye towards having a negotiation of some sort, and where we can at least in the first instance, you know, freeze the, freeze the program as we proceed towards solving the problem in a deeper way. And the 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 role of the Chinese incredibly important here. One would think that we would be wanting to to talk to them bilaterally about how we together can deal with this problem and not not alienate them, right? Not threaten them. We need them on side. And allies. If you go through the list, if we're in the situation room, right, and we had a, and we were working through a strategy, it would be a multidimensional strategy. It would start with allies uh, and, the, and the necessity of staying really closely aligned and leading allies in this area. It would then move to the pressure campaign um, so across a number of dimensions, diplomatically, very importantly, economically. Uh, you would then have the assets that we need. Part mm-hmm. of the pressure campaign is also our military assets. There are military aspects distressing and pressing the, uh, the North Koreans. There's a missile defense set of uh, assets and, and dimensions to it. And there is this important dialogue that has to happen with the Chinese about where this is going to go. The direction here in terms of Chinese interest is all negative. It is uh, a regime that is acting you know, increasingly more provocative provocative, a regime that is drawing in, you know, from the Chinese perspective, much more activity and assets by the United States right. and its allies right. Right. and could be provoking other, other countries in the region to move towards acquiring nuclear weapons. Right. So they have, they have an interest here in, yeah. in solving this problem. And it takes a while. You know, now they, you know, they'll push back and say that, well, the United States needs to be it's your principal problem. Well, no, they have a problem here too, right? And, that, and it is important to have a deep dialogue with the Chinese about the path forward right. here, uh, trying to solve this problem short of a military conflict. Iran. 
president has to certify or not in the next few weeks the Iran nuclear deal. Very aggressive Iranian behavior in the Middle East. At the same time, you have a real debate inside Iran between the hardliners and the centrists about the future direction of that country. Is it going to be a revolutionary state or is it going to be a normal state? How do you think about how we should be approaching? Iran? Well, the first thing is that we should, uh, you know, the, the IAEA, the UN organization which oversees the nuclear deal that was entered into between the international community and Iran, says that they've been abiding by them in, in the main by their obligations. Our Secretary of State has said that. All of our allies have said that. So, so pulling out of that, and I don't view that as anything but letting the Iranians off the hook. Right. They have- And playing to the hardliners. Right, exactly right. So it would be a very serious mistake for the United States to withdraw from this deal. And it's an interesting thing. The deal was a transactional set of understandings, an arms control deal, right? It was not intended by anyone who really had any kind of sense of this, that it was going to be some sort of transformational. That would be naive. It was a transactional deal. It was an arms control transactional deal. It was meant to increase stability and security and allow us to have additional channels with the Iranians. And it has done that. And I think if you talk to officials in the region, I think it'd be hard to find someone who thinks it's a really good idea to pull out of this deal at this point. And, you know, this all or nothing attitude towards arms control deals is really dangerous. You know, we did this in 2002, 2003 right. in the North Korea case, and it would have been a much better path to have them held their feet to the fire on their obligations under the agreed framework and deal with the additional problems, just as in this case, hold the Iranians' feet to the fire with respect to their, their obligations under this deal, which I think have been very positive yeah. for the United States and the world, and then address in a comprehensive way their very bad behavior. And the I similarities thought, between the agreed yeah, framework and yeah. this deal are not lost on It's me. interesting, yeah. They should be confronted with additional sanctions, with diplomatic pressure, you know, with military presence, all that outside the four corners of the deal. On the regional stuff. On the regional stuff, right. And we also should be talking, I think, sooner rather than later, about how to extend the provisions of this deal beyond its current terms. Russia. Yeah. Putin's fundamental goal, besides staying in power and, and having influence in his neighborhood, is uh, to be seen as a great power. He does not have the capability to, to rise to that. So his approach is to undermine us everywhere he can around the world, including here at home. And it wasn't just the election meddling. We now know it goes beyond that to trying to divide us on race and gender and a whole bunch of issues. And it continues to this very day. How do you think about that? I think that Vladimir Putin came back to office in the spring of 2012 and decided to take Russia in a very different direction. And the direction was that he was going to assert Russian as best he could, playing, you know, not from the strongest hand. He was going to assert Russian interest in global problems and regional problems around the world aggressively. He was going to define Russian foreign policy in counterdistinction to the West and resisting the West in particular of the United States. He did this for a variety of reasons, including his own domestic political reasons in Russia. He was, you know, he's, he was pushing against kind of an open door here, unlocked door with respect to Russian history and tendencies. Right, right. Nationalism. Nationalism. And it's become apparently a nationalist right now in Russia. And essentially my own judgment, Michael, is that we are in an actively hostile posture vis-a-vis -vis the Russians right now. And it's not just in Syria and in Europe. It's in, certainly in those places, it's in Crimea, it's in Europe, it's along the borders of NATO, it is in North Afghanistan. Africa it's and in, in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, right? You know, General, you know, Secretary Mattis saying just the other day that the Russians are involved in arming the, uh, to arming and supporting the Taliban. We are in an actively hostile posture, and of course, most dramatically in the direct Russian interference in the 2016 election. So what do we do about it? Well, I think, first of all, you have to deal from a position of strength. And I think that one is that we need to make sure that we are lockstep with our allies in Europe and that we anticipate what Russia may do in Europe and that we are building the capabilities there to find that and resist that. I think that's really a critical point, first and foremost, is with allies. The second piece of this, I think, is that we need to ensure that the United States builds out the resilience to resist what we can expect, which would be future Russian efforts to interfere in our electoral process going forward in 2018 and 2020. We have not done that in a comprehensive way. Part of this is the very odd refusal, the administration, to admit right, the, or recognize what the intelligence services have said, which is the direct Russian interference, and to put together a plan to do something about it. This administration right. would really do itself in the country a really serious and good service. Right? Would we to kind of put together a commission of sorts? Right. To do two things, right? One is, is how do we defend ourselves, yeah. right? And the other is how do we deter him from going down this path? Yeah, that's, I think that's exactly right. And then we need to start to think hard about we're in a new world vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. What are the rules of the road going to be? Lastly, China. We talked about it in the context of North Korea, but there's a bigger issue, as yeah. you know. How are we and the Chinese going to coexist? How do we make sure that over the long term, this relationship maximizes the chances for cooperation, the kind of thing we saw 
between President Obama and President Xi on climate change, and how do we avoid confrontation? How do you think about that? Well, it's becoming it's becoming a more competitive relationship as China China you know, asserts itself in the world, particularly in the region. So I think about it having kind of three or four dimensions, which I think are really important. Number one is for the United States to continue its historic commitment and presence in the region. This is absolutely critical. It's the most important thing that the United States can do in Asia, where a lot of the history of the 21st century is going to be written. Secondly is that we do have serious economic issues with the, with the Chinese right now, economic and business issues. The administration's been focused on the bilateral trade deficit with China. My own view is more important issues are access issues uh, for U.S. companies, how U.S. companies and foreign companies are being treated there, technological issues, and the, kind of the forced trading of technology right. for, for access, lack of reciprocity. These are, I think, the real issues. And I think that they're going to have to be engaged, frankly, going forward. We have a 600 plus billion dollar a year economic relationship, and we need to in- ensure that it's as fair as possible. Critically, I think going forward is the U.S. needs to really focus on the technologies of the future and to make sure that we're doing the kinds of basic research and investment that we've done historically. We have had in this country, really from the beginning of the country, we're kind of the American system, right? But since World War II in the 1950s, we have had a tremendously successful partnership between the government and the private sector and the development of technology. We are falling off on these investments and the Chinese are not. This is really one of the I think the critical things for us to look at going forward. So, Tom, you have been extraordinarily gracious with your time. If I could just maybe ask you one more question. You have a tremendous amount of experience telling presidents what they need to hear, perhaps even when they don't want to hear it. So I'm wondering if, if you had a private moment with President Trump and he asked you for your candid advice, what would you what would you say to him? I'd say th- three or four things. One is staff the government. We really are in a situation which is inhibiting the United States from doing what it needs to do in the world. We are in a very bad shape in terms of staffing the United States government. Particularly at, at your Particularly at, at state. At the State Department, right? You know, and you know, the principal domestic arm of our of our national security efforts, right? And we're not, you know, I think we've only we've only staffed a couple of the of the assistant secretary positions there. Why are those political appointments so important. Why can't the career people pick up the slack? One of the great strengths of our system is that we rotate people in to really advocate strongly for the positions and policies of the presidents that get elected. And it's new blood, it's new energy, and they feel the confidence to be able to lead and not not bog down and saying we're going to do it this way because that's the way we did it before. It's a real, this is a really important source of strength in the U.S. system, which is to have people come in in these Senate appointed, Senate, Senate presidential appointed, Senate approved uh, positions, I think, really important. The second thing I would say is become much more familiar with the career staff and the diplomatic, military, and intelligence services in the United States. The president came in and kind of had a difficult set of encounters. And I hope that his team, and I I think they are, he needs to become familiar, much more familiar with the strengths of these organizations because they can really help promote promote the U.S. interest. And he will find, if he spends any more, any serious time with them, that they are a real national asset. And as he goes forward in his presidency, it's going to be very important that these individuals in the career, diplomatic, military, and intelligence services feel comfortable bringing forward what they know about what's going on in the world. This is really important. I think third is we need to engage in a really serious reassurance effort with allies. And fourth, I understand that President Trump you know, really got elected in, in some ways through his skillful use of social media. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I understand that's an important way for him to continue to communicate with the country. And, and I understand that's, that's going to be that's going to be an essential element of his presidency going forward, mm-hmm. my, my observation. Be careful doing this on the foreign policy and national security right. side. I would try to right. distinguish between communicating generally with the country and communicating with the world right. on these things. Two completely different Two very things. different exercises. And I would not right. be doing Twitter at this. I would be doing something different. I understand the strength of the president's ability to communicate via via Twitter, not in these national security areas. Those would be the four things that I would uh, that I would pass on to him if I had the opportunity. Tom, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Michael. Great to see you. That was Tom Donilon. I'm Michael Morell. This is Intelligence Matters. Please join us next week.